We did not have the strength to withstand it, and that's why the uprising started. Something had to give. In 1954, Easter was the first day with warm wind. Many people were in a festive kind of mood. Prisoners greeted one another. Even hard work that day seemed easier. It was Easter, May the 12th. I was already at work. A prisoner column of men left work and a prisoner column of women went to work. There were five of us in the prisoner column. We were forced to keep our eyes straight ahead. There were two guards ahead of us, two on the outside and one with a dog at the rear. We were moving forward and by accident we met the boys. One boy recognized a girl from his village. He took off his cap and shouted, Christ is risen. And the girls answered, he has risen indeed, but talking was forbidden in a prison column. You were forbidden from talking. The guards fired on the column. Twelve people were wounded and six of them were killed. The next day, another tragedy took place. It was May the 15th, 1954. From time to time, they showed a film. It was a kind of film that was projected on the wall of our canteen. And suddenly, we saw the criminals who jumped through this wall from the 3rd Division to our division. Where are you going? To the women, to the women. Each of them screamed those words. They said the camp's security officer, Godfather, as he was called in the Gulag, had promised the criminals some liberties in exchange for cooperating with him. The security told them that they are Hodzluczki. That's how they called the Ukrainian girls in the 1st Division. They will be glad to see you. Everything will be OK. The guys decided to help the women, as they were associates. That's why political prisoners followed the criminals. Some of our guys came to our division. Here was one woman whose son was a prisoner as well. The son ran to see her. The administration called a group of gunmen. They blocked the way to the women's division, and the others with shovels went to help the boys to kick the security men from the women's division. There were dozens of men in our division. The gunmen wanted to shoot them, but the women went out from the barracks and surrounded the men. We all grabbed each other's hands and held them while the men were in the middle. This way, the women shielded the men. Gunmen started to scream, go away, go away, because they did not want to shoot the women. They tried to frighten the prisoners by shooting over their heads, but it didn't work. They brought a fire engine and doused us in water. They thought that we would run away, but we stayed there, totally wet. The soldiers were then ordered to leave the women's division, so the guy prisoners were saved. But the event spilled over to another place, the housekeeping division. By that time, a lot of men had gathered there. The gates were closed there, and a lot of people were gathered. When the soldiers opened the gates and the prisoners started to scream, till the end, till the end, and the soldiers began to shoot. Ferenc Varkany, 
wrote that about 70 prisoners were killed. Vagarshak Batuyan added that a lot of people were beaten beyond recognition with metal bars. During the night, all the brigades agreed not to go to work. As the camp administration was responsible for the production schedule, all of them were able to persuade the prisoners to go to work. The inmates set the conditions to punish those guilty of the brutal shooting. To take off the prisoners' numbers, to remove the bars from the windows, to destroy the wall between the divisions and to give the permission to communicate with women. The fulfillment of those conditions largely coincided with the orders from Moscow. That's why the administration promised to deliver if only the prisoners went to work. We went to work on May the 17th, and when we returned, the head of the camp began to read the orders. There will be a wall between the divisions, because the rules have been violated. Those who try to cross this wall will be shot on sight. Even hardened old-time convicts were surprised by the treacherous brutality of the authorities. The bars and locks stayed put, and the promised passages between the divisions were blocked. Instead, towers with machine guns appeared. And on May the 18th, we did not come to work. And something started. Something that the authorities called mass unrest, disobedience, banditry, rebellion, and the rebels called holiday and celebration. We needed to unite with other divisions, 4,000 male political prisoners. We started to dig under the wall, to make a tunnel under the wall to their unit. Then we will have 8,000 rebellious prisoners, security guards with machine guns shot beneath the wall and tried to cut us off from the wall. Not far from there was the canteen. We started to take out the tables, chairs and benches and throw them under the wall in order to build barricades. Under the protection of this makeshift barricade, rebels began to violently ram the wall. Machine guns shot through the barricades, but there was a small shadow near our barracks that gave other groups of guys cover, and they began to make a tunnel there. They finished it, and we started entering the second division. That was how the first and second divisions were united. Then, together, both groups of prisoners broke down the gates and entered the housekeeping division. But in front of them lay a massive wall. In the women's division, there was a wall five meters high and one meter in width and with barbed wire. Arm in arm, together, we took the rail. One, two, take and beat the wall. One, two, take and beat the wall. And we united with the next division, so there were three divisions all together, through one tunnel to the second division, then through the household division to ours. I broke the lock, opened the door and said, good evening, girls, we came to visit you. We were mixed, men and women, just as they came to us. It was happiness, one said, dad, the others, mum, daughter. I screamed, sister, where are you, brother, where are you, and that's how we found each other. The walls that separated us broke down. Brothers met their sisters, fathers met their sons, wives met their husbands, and girlfriends met their boyfriends. Those were the words of the anthem of the uprising, written by Mikhailo Soroka. It seemed difficult to find anyone in that mess. 
but the heart showed the way. Olga and Ferenc found each other. We met each other and first I was a little bit scared. He hardly had any teeth. Then he disappeared for three days and returned as a handsome man. And we met each other very often. The prisoners had only one gate left. In our concentration camp, there was a prison inside a prison where prisoners were sentenced to be shot. We broke in and released 250 to 270 people, including Soroka Mikhailo. For the first time in the history of the camp, there were no prisoners. Here, behind barbed wire, they became free. All the jailers were thrown out from the camp. That's all. There's nobody here. Now we run the camp. The next day, we bid farewell to our fellow prisoners who were killed. The Ukrainians wore their embroidered shirts. One Uzbek and one of the criminals brought five dead men. The Ukrainians were very beautiful in embroidered shirts, so together with the help of the girls, we found two more shirts and put them on these Uzbeks and this criminal. We laid them in the coffins so that they could be buried outside of the Gulag. This women's wisdom finally united the camp, the Muslims with the Orthodox and criminals with political prisoners. And after this, we had a reunion, and Kuznetsov took the floor and proposed to be the head. Thirteen other men were elected to be responsible for the culture, for the order, and so on. It was a kind of ministry, and it was order, order. There were all nationalities in that committee, Ukrainians, Belarusians and Russians, everyone. The men came to the women on the hill so that they would all be together in case of an attack. The situation was so serious that the very top-ranking authorities had to react. The Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs, the Deputy Prosecutors, the General Prosecutor of the USSR, Heads of Security Departments of the Republic and the Regions, all of them were here. The Generals were on one side and our guys were on the other. I was also there as a guard and had a big knife, and we proposed to sign the agreement. Our requirements were the following, to review the cases of minors and to release them, to take into consideration the cases of all who had earned credits during their stay, and to start working with people. Other requirements were to investigate all events related to the use of weapons during 1954 and punish the perpetrators, to establish an eight-hour working day and introduce payment for work, and finally... And we demanded that somebody from the Central Committee of the party would be present so we could believe what was taking place. There was one Azerbaijani, the colonel, and he gave a speech. Why am I here? Why did you put a machine gun to my head? I was at war. I helped take Berlin, and you sentenced me to 25 years. What are you doing with us? Who are you? You are fascists. The negotiations dragged on. The generals first tried persuasion and then began to threaten the prisoners. In return, the rebels began to prepare for defense. We didn't feel like numbers anymore, but like human beings again. 
و گرشک بطیان ریکولد The administration had everything, the army, the regime and the prosecutors and the prisoners had nothing except their spirit, fists and stones. We took the bricks out of the household yard. We made barricades, all like the flies. We broke the glass. The girls took tops off the matches and made shells. Everything was here. We had our own authorities and rules, our own security and discipline, all like in the state. It should be two or three boys and two or three girls on the post in order to support each other. The boys wanted to show their bravery. Together they watched to see if there were any provocations or attacks from the KGB or any internal military forces. The commission of the camp elected by the rebels not only negotiated with Gulag authorities, but also provided for people's needs. There was also a deeply undercover center. There were often fundamental contradictions between the commission of the camp and the representatives of the undercover center. It was actually a confrontation of views, communist and nationalist, moderate and radical. The first were ready to believe the promises of the generals. The others did not believe and were ready to go to the end. The representatives of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists were undercover in the commission of the camp which ruled this uprising. They pretty much refused to obey. They insisted on inviting the representatives of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the members of its organization to resolve issues connected either with the softening of the regime and also with the complete liberation from imprisonment. The full list of members of the undercover center is still unknown. I could identify only some names if it was a matter of further research. Of course, Mikhailo Soroka was one of the ideologists. Nobody would squeal on him, by the way. Then this Gersh, Iosip Keller, and then this Orthodox priest, Sunichuk. He was a Ukrainian insurgent army fighter at the same time. Still a few names, Kostritsky, Zadorozhny, Ivashchenko. They were leaders among the rebels. They ruled the uprising. They were involved in various commissions, but unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about them. We were under the command of Keller, a former guard of Grom Squad, and I was in the guard. Gersh Keller, a former commanding officer of the Ukrainian insurgent army, headed the military division. We took the bars in windows and doors and sharpened their ends. They would serve as our weapons in case of attack from their security. The military division organized the work of Lithuanian scientists and rebels in manufacturing explosives. The Ukrainian from Zaporizhia, Anatoly Kostritsky, led the workshop producing improvised grenades, mines and pistols. Still, the main weapons the rebels had were various kinds of cold steel arms, spears, knives, sabers. They produced thousands of them. All young men arrived with these spears and wires. We knew that there would be a battle. For the rebel security guards, special uniforms were made, very similar to those of the Ukrainian insurgent army. A Jewish former naval officer, poet and political prisoner, Anatoly Radigin, wrote in his memoirs. Among the grey crowd of the camp, there were two groups which stood out. 
they were different from colorless faces, nondescript movements, and drab present jackets. They were former soldiers and officers of the Ukrainian insurgent army, members of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, and non-partisan Ukrainian patriots. When you would spot someone smart and elegant, quiet and calm, shaved, in a clean shirt, clean shoes, and carefully ironed present clothes, you could almost for sure tell his nationality, party membership, and under which flag he fought. Meanwhile, the camp lived a normal life, and it was a party, sabantui, as the rebels used to say. That's what Bashkirs and Tatars called their folk festival. The camp's cultural life was managed by Lyubov Bershatska, a former soloist ballet dancer of the Bolshoi Theater. In general, there were many artists in the camp. There were even concerts at Georgian stage them. Despite everything, the Ukrainians knew how not to be bored. The Latvians staged the concerts very well. They found old blankets and stitched the skirts. They staged the national dances and introduced their culture. It was so interesting. Lysia Konko, a former artist of the Kiev Opera House, organized the choir. There were a lot of choirs in the camp, Ukrainian ones, as the Ukrainians are very good musical people. As the Ukrainian language was spoken by the majority of the inmates, many non-Ukrainian speakers gradually switched to it. That was also largely due to Mikhailo Soroka. Thanks to him, Ukrainian songs sounded everywhere. He was such a person who could do everything. He was a person who glowed, who emitted a special aura which gave energy to others. It was impossible not to love him, not to listen to him. He was a very authoritative person, and that's why everybody followed him. He was a poet and a talented philosopher. He should not expose himself that he was an organizer of the uprising. If he showed himself, they would eat him alive. Actually, he was the head of the Kengir uprising. Mikhail Soroka wrote the anthem of the Kengir uprising in just one night. In the hot steppes of Kazakhstan, special camps were stirred up and tired backs were straightened because it was not the time to moan. And this anthem was sung not only by Ukrainians, but by all nationalities, the anthem of the Kengir uprising. But we became free and loved each other. There was no hate. It did not matter if you were Russian or Chechen. The Armenians, the Kurds, even some Japanese. It was all one family. It was like on Maidan, all the relatives. There were no differences if you were Russian or Uzbek, Moldovan or Jewish. Everyone was a single unit. 
They were all united by their position against the political regime, which, because of various circumstances, they found themselves together behind the barbed wire. And it was almost a brotherhood of men and women and prisoners of different nationalities. This indicates the power which people felt to unite against the regime. How the Kingur uprising finished, our heroes will tell us in the last film of the trilogy.